the road home, I believe, is one of, one of the ministries that is the closest to God's heart. Isaiah 58 has the greatest promises that God could give anybody. And it's related to taking care of the homeless and not hiding yourself from your own flesh. And, and then the fact that we, we're, we're working together as a region, the region-wide church in unity to meet a need that is so close to the heart of God. It's, it's just an amazing ministry. And this Tuesday night at the prayer meeting, we are going to be featuring them and uh, praying for all those that are involved with the road home as well. So, all right. How's everybody today? Got a number of people that are usually at the 8.30 service that are just waking up right now. (laughs) Could we stand together in honor of God's word? If you have a Bible with you, turn to Genesis chapter 1. You can find that on page 1 of your Bible. We're going to read verses 11 through 13. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation plants yielding seed after their kind and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a third day. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, you, through what you have created... You have revealed, it says in Romans, your divine nature. That we, we can learn about you by looking at what you made. And Lord, if there is anything that we take for granted day after day, it's creation itself. Would you enlarge our hearts, God? Would you speak to us as we contemplate creation? Help us, we ask God in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. When I decided to do this series on creation, I'm just going to be honest with you. I was really excited for me. (laughs) Because when I do a series on something, I get to study it. I get to, to teach something. You have to learn about it first. And... I just, I love learning about stuff and I really didn't know that much about creation. And so a lot of what I'm going to share today is fresh to me and uh, I hope it will bless you as well. Point one is plants that God made. Uh, this, it, the, the idea, God, it says that God said, let there be plants and let them come forth, seed-bearing plants and fruit trees, and it was so. God, God just so understates what he's doing. Do you know that there are 315,000 different species of plants? With that one word, 300,000 species came into existence and another 100,000 different species of trees. Trees also are plants. They are, they are plants that have a single stem that we call a trunk, of course, and they grow much larger than all the other plants. Trees can grow up to over 300 feet tall and live much longer. Trees can live 5,000 years. Stunning. God brings forth by his word all of these species of plants. Some of the plants are for our food. Different types of food. Seeds. 
corn, rice, beans, wheat, they are all seeds that we are eating. Grains, all grains are seeds, but not all seeds are grains. So one type of food is just the seeds. You eat the seed themselves. Another type of food he made is roots. Carrots and potatoes and beets and turnips. We're all, those are all roots. We're eating the root. And of course, we're very familiar with fruit. The oranges and the apples and, the, and watermelon and all kinds of different fruits that God has made. Some plants he made for just beauty and fragrance. Think of the miracle of flowers. Think of what a flower is saying about the one who made it. Listen to Romans 120. For since the creation of the world, God, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. So God is speaking about himself through everything that he makes. So he makes these beautiful flowers, infinite varieties of flowers, and within their beauty, there's also fragrance. So you've got the beauty of heaven and the fragrance of heaven tied up in this one flower. And then I was studying, my oh my, just studying about roses. And all of the different uses for roses. Medicine, teas, perfumes. God has put healing in plants. There are, plants are often just loaded with vitamins and things that we need. And so all of the things that, that we have drawn out of plants, they all speak of God and of who God is. They had this one website that had 20 amazing plants. One of them is the Amazon water lily. The Amazon water lily starts at the bottom of the pond and it has a 30 foot stem. And once it gets to the top, within two days, its leaf sprouts and its leaf goes six feet across. And it's got spines on the bottom so fish won't eat it. And it curls up like this so there's room for other Amazon water lilies. And when these guys fill a pond, the whole pond is filled with these Amazon water lilies. But there's an amazing thing that happens with their flowers. They're flying. You can see a YouTube of the Amazon water lily. These flowers are the most brilliant white flowers. And when they come out, when their flower comes out, this white draws this certain type of beetle to its flower. And so these beetles will come and they will get right in the middle of that flower and sometimes up to 40 beetles will be in the flower at one time. And once they all get in there, the flower closes. <laughs> And they get trapped in there for 24 hours. They're in there. And they get filled with the pollen of that flower because God has made the Amazon water lily as many plants. They need, they don't, many of them do not pollinize themselves. They need, there's this interdependence where they need the pollen to go from here to here for this plant to be flowering and seed bearing and fruit bearing. And so you have to have this pollination, this, this interdependence. And oftentimes pollen spreads by the wind, but so, sometimes God has left it to insects to move the pollen from one to another. So you, there's this tremendous interdependence. So here's what happens. So after 24 hours, the flower opens and these beetles can all fly away then. And then God does something interesting with the Amazon water lily. They were drawn to that brilliant white and so that they will know that this flower, don't come back to this flower, it changes color. It changes to pink. 
And so the beetle knows, don't go back there. Take it somewhere else. Why is God so into this interdependence? He's speaking of himself. God is love, which means if God is love, there has to be more than one person in God. There are three persons in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from all eternity. There is this divine interdependence. It's not one plus one plus one equals three gods. It's one times one times one equals one God. One God interdependent. He has made us interdependent on each other. And he speaks to us even through creation, this divine interdependence. The plants that God has made. Did you notice in these few verses that seeds are mentioned several times? And that the significant thing about these plants is that they're seed bearing. And the significant thing about the fruits is that they have seeds in them. God has a lot to teach us from seeds. And that's point two, learning from seeds. First, Seeds, I want to talk about first the appearance of seeds. Seeds are deceptive because they're so small. You wouldn't think something that small could be that powerful. But yet in a seed is everything. Everything's in the seed. The, the, the trunk is there. The roots are there. The flowers are there. The fruit is there. The the longevity is there. More seeds are in that one seed. It's, it's stunning when you think about it. Of all that is packed into a seed. Listen to the words of Jesus about the kingdom of God. This is Matthew 13, 31 and 32. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. When a man took and planted which a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. All right, so I've got a picture of a a mustard seed. Here is the seed. Doesn't look like much, does it? Jesus said, this is, the, this is the kingdom of heaven. It's going to come like this, this little seed. And it's not going to look like, like much. It's, it's not going to look like it could produce much. Okay? Here's a mustard tree. <clears throat> the significance of the mustard tree, it's not the tallest tree. There's, there's lots of trees that get much taller. It grows to about 20 feet high. The significance of it is, is that it grows just as wide as it is high. So it's 20 feet high and it's 20 feet wide. Now, could you imagine having one of these in your garden? (laughs) Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is going to operate like a mustard seed. It's going to start out small. But it will more and more and more and more take up your life. If this thing grows, and this is why Jesus said, count the cost up front. Tell them the cost up front. Because it's, it's so easy to start in the kingdom of God. You can start today. You can ask Christ into your heart today. You can respond to the gospel today. And he'll put a seed in there. But he wanted us to know up front. When you're in, this thing's going to grow and it's going to take over the garden. It will take over every single area of your life. You're going to find out that God is passionate about everything about your life. And everything will be different when you allow the word of God, the salvation of God to grow in you. It is like a mustard seed when it starts. And then it grows and it takes up the whole garden. All right, so that's the appearance of seeds. Secondly, The abundance of seeds. 
We, uh, we were in Florida a couple weeks ago for five days. And I know what you're thinking. Don't go there. Because it was like 50, 50 degrees. <laughs> we were in sweaters and sweatshirts all week long. But that's a small price to pay when you're staring at the ocean every day just coming in. It was amazing. Anyway, um, but th- there were some farmers that... Uh, from Montevideo, good friends of ours that had rented this house for the whole month and they wanted us to come down and stay with them for a while and then they gave us a few days with just us. And, and so, but I'm working on this. I, I'm just, my heart is filled with seeds and plants and, and Cliff is the guy's name and he's, he's a farmer and I say, bro, t- you know, let's talk. Let's talk about corn. He's a corn and beans guy. And... Uh, so one kernel of corn, all, gr- all grains, just so we're on the same page, all grains are seeds. Not all seeds are grains. But when you talk about grain, you're talking about seeds. So every kernel of corn on a cob is a seed that can plant another stalk. And when you plant a stalk, this is today's technology, they get one good ear per stalk. Now, they're working on it where eventually they could get two ears that are usable per stalk. Maybe they could do up to five, actually. So pray for farmers. Anyway, um, but that one ear of corn per stalk has six, an average of 600 more seeds. There's 600 kernels of corn on one ear. In one acre of corn... He plants 36,000 seeds. Of those in normal conditions, 35,000 of them will will grow and produce a stalk and an ear. So one acre of corn, you're planting 35,000 seeds that come forth. And each one of them makes 600 new seeds. So one acre of corn has... 21 million seeds that could all be planted. Just thinking about apples and reading about apples. and do you, do you know how many apples are in one apple seed? An infinite amount of apples are in one apple seed. Because one apple seed produces a tree. And an apple tree, a a full-grown mature apple tree will produce about 200 apples a year. And the average apple has five seeds. So every year, you're getting a thousand new seeds that can all produce other trees every single year. So one little apple seed has in it not just a tree... It has a tree in it, but that tree has got fruit, and in that fruit has a thousand seeds per year to make more trees. And so this is, this is the abundance of God. This is the power of a seed. There is an infinite amount of fruit in one seed. Isn't God amazing? Now listen to what Jesus said about seeds. Matthew 13, verse 23. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. 13, verse 12. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. So this is how the kingdom works. Jesus uses the parable of the sower. He starts off speaking his teaching about the parables with the parable of the sower. And the disciples say, what, what does this mean? And he said, if you don't understand this one, you're not going to understand any of them. He said, this has got the key to how the kingdom of God works. So the parable of the sower is absolutely the key to unlock the other parables. And he says, 
The seed is the Word of God. The Word of God is going to act like a seed. And when the Word of God comes in, when the Word of God is planted in a life, and of course the Word of God is the preached Word of God, but it's actually revealing the person who is the Word of God. Jesus is the message of God. Jesus is the Word from all eternity that became flesh. And within the Word of God, within the salvation of God that He plants in us, is the very life, the very beauty, the very glory, the very power of His own Son, who is becoming the Word, become flesh in us. So we are the soil, and literally when... Not literally, not literally, figuratively. There's a tree growing in you called the kingdom of God. So you got this tree growing up in the middle of your life that is changing your life. And it grows. It's a miracle, it says, how the kingdom grows. It grows all by itself. So I'm thinking about abundance. Abundance. I'm thinking about the power of a seed. I'm I'm thinking of what 30, 60, and 100 fold means. And not only bringing forth fruit, but bringing forth fruit that has seeds in it to reproduce the kingdom of God. And I'm just just filled with this. And I get back here, and uh, Monday night, we went out and saw the movie. Has anybody seen the movie Son of God yet? Yeah, the people that made the Bible made that movie. Fantastic movie. But but I'm already filled with this thought of the abundance in the kingdom of God, and I see the, uh, the calling of Peter. Peter, of course, is a fisherman. And they have been out fishing all night long and have caught nothing. Now, it's really important when we think about fishing that you see that this is his employment. If this is your hobby and you have a whole night fishing and you catch nothing, you're disappointed. Okay, but if it's your livelihood and you, and you go out all night long, you, there's already fear there or you probably wouldn't be fishing all night long. And then to fish all night long and catch nothing, that's, serious, that's, that's a problem. That's a problem if you're a fisherman. And so Jesus comes and he says, Peter, put the boat back out. And Peter lets Jesus know that that's not going to work. You're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. It's not going to work. But because of who you are, we're going to go ahead and prove that it won't work. I'm going to do what you're telling me to do. And then we'll, you're saying it. I don't want to offend you. So we'll we'll go ahead and do it. But it's not going to work. So they go out and he says, put the, put the nets down here. And, and there is a catch that is so big that the boat begins to sink. This is why Peter says, well, he says, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, fear not. From now on, you're going to be catching men. And it says that that Peter left everything and followed him after that. It was an encounter with the abundance of the kingdom of God. It It was an encounter with human lack and then divine abundance that was a whole different system that impressed Peter enough to leave everything to follow him. There is an abundance in the kingdom of God. And to walk in the kingdom, you need to change your mindset from lack to abundance. And that is very easy to say, but it's very hard to do. Because we live in a world that's filled with lack. we filled with a world that's filled with problems. We, the, the real world has got so many issues and so many things that are wrong and sinful and dark and hard and confused. And, and so it's very hard to see in this world through the eyes of abundance when there's so much lack all around us. And so, so here's what happens with the disciples. They, are, they get into the boat and 
Jesus, as he often did, starts teaching. And he's teaching them about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And when he says the word leaven, something triggers in there, in the disciples' minds, about bread. Because that's how you get, leaven is with bread, and so they're thinking about bread, and then they're thinking like, oh my, we forgot the bread. We forgot the bread. This is Jesus. Jesus is very subtle, and he's kind of mysterious, and this is his way of telling us that you, you dummies, you forgot the bread. And so they're having this little conversation with each other about Jesus is trying to teach. And they're having this little side conversation about you forgot the bed. No, it was you. No, it was you. Anyway, um, Jesus, Jesus gets upset, frustrated. And he says, do you have eyes but don't see? Do you have ears that don't hear? And then he asked them this question. This is Mark 8, 19 through 21. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you bring up? Did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand. Earlier he said, are your hearts so hard? Do you think this was just about feeding the multitudes? My miracles are to teach you a different way of thinking, a different way at looking at this world. And did you notice something in this? He doesn't even reference, he doesn't ask them about how many were fed. He asks them about the leftovers. When I took the five loaves and fed 5,000 people, which, you know, I would think that would be impressive enough. But what he asks them about is how many baskets were left over? Twelve. And after I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many basketfuls were left over? And they said seven. He says, don't you understand? There is an abundance in the kingdom of God. There is more than enough. This is the mindset of the kingdom of God. And I'm trying to get you guys to change your thinking. I'm trying to get you guys, when you see lack... I need you to also see my abundance. I need you to see that any situation, any problem, because they're going to be all around you, I need you to have in your heart that as long as we are traveling with Jesus, as long as we are hosting his presence, as long as we are walking with him, there's always going to be an answer for every need and more than enough. The abundance of God. Disciples have been walking with them a long time. They were, they were being challenged to change how they think. How many know it's hard to change how you think? When you've thought a certain way for a long time, it's very hard. When you've thought of the whole world as a fixed pie of resources, and this is how much resource, and we need to get our peace, and we better get it now, and we're afraid because this is all we have, and, and I need to get this before that guy gets this because this is all there is in the world. And Jesus said, stop it. We're not, we're not operating on a fixed pie. All the resources of heaven... My God is able to richly supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Change your mindset. And here's why it's so important we have the right mindset. Because it's only with the mindset of the abundance of heaven that we are able to fully give ourselves, to deny ourselves, and to do the work of the kingdom. Listen, listen to John chapter 12, 23 and 24. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, 
it produces many seeds. Jesus is speaking here of his own death. And he says, as long as I am preserving my own life, uh, it will just be alone. It'll just be my ministry. But if I am willing to give my life away, if I am willing to sow my life, the Father has promised this, that it's going to bear much fruit. It's going to bring forth many, many seeds. In the very next verse after that, he says, so whoever loves his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake will find life. The kingdom cannot advance in your life if you live for self-preservation. As long as you're in self-protection and fear is guiding you and fear is what you're all about and preserving yourself and making sure you're safe, a kingdom can't advance. So you have to have confidence. God loves you. Jesus knows all your needs. Jesus said, the Father knows all that you need, ye of little faith. He clothes the lilies of the field. He feeds the birds of the air. He is going to take care of you. You don't have to live the way the Gentiles live. What are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Where are we going to live? What are we going to do tomorrow? He said, don't live that way. That's how the Gentiles are living. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you. The abundance of God. You've got to be convinced of the abundance of God, his abundant love for you, his abundant provision for you, for you, for your family, for your future. You've got to be convinced so that you can live not for self-preservation, but you Fully give yourself to whatever God is calling you to do. Don't shout me down, folks. So the appearance of a seed, the abundance of a seed, and then finally the vulnerability of a seed. Jesus says this, whoever does not have Even what he has will be taken from him. How many know that's a contradiction? How can you not have something? Jesus says it. You don't have it. Oh, I'm sorry. We're on the next screen. Yeah, there it is. You don't have it. If you don't have it, then how can it be taken from them if you don't even have it? How can both of these things be true? Matthew 13, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So here's what's what's going on. Jesus, who is the farmer who is sowing the kingdom of God, he scatters this seed and he sows seed into the human heart that has salvation in it. It's got beauty in it. It's got fruit in it. It's got all the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They're all in this seed. It's going to change their life. It's going to give them heaven. It's going to... In that seed is the relationship with God that goes on for all eternity. And he sows this seed in the human heart. And so, in one sense, they have it. Isn't that right? If it's been sown in their heart, they have it. Isn't that right? But if they don't understand what they have, if they don't understand this is the word of God, this is not another opinion, this is not some man yelling at us, this is, this, this is the very word of God, this is the treasured, valued word of God. If they just think it's another philosophy or another way of looking at the world or another thought or, or that's interesting or that's funny or that's... As long as they don't understand this is the Word of God, even though they have it, they don't have it. They don't have it because it's vulnerable. If you don't understand what salvation is, 
If you don't understand how precious Jesus is and salvation is, this is everything. And if you don't understand it and you don't value it, it is vulnerable and the enemy will come and he'll just take it. He'll just take it. So we have this uh, where the, Satan just immediately takes it. He just brings another lie, brings another distraction. And that moment where the word was sown is gone and you lose what you had. But there's another way you can lose what you had. And that is through competition. The third heart is about the thorns. And this person received the word of God and the word of God is in them and the word is growing in them. But because it is not valued, because it's not center, because it's not the most important thing in their life, the cares and the worries of this life and the pleasures of this life, and Mark says the desires for other things, anything can do it, that that their garden, they make the kingdom of God one part of the garden of their life. So this is my little Sunday morning compartment. And maybe you even add another night of the week. But this is the kingdom of God. And then I've got this other area of my life called family and work and friends and fun. And and the kingdom of God is in this little compartment. But it's not affecting all the other parts of your life. You're you're, You're planting all these things in your garden. The Bible says that the word is going to be taken through competition and that the thorns and the thistles, all of the other things that you've made equally important to the kingdom of God are eventually going to choke out the word of God because the word of God is vulnerable if it's not treated as precious. This parable of the sower and the seed is key to understanding all the parables, including the one that's just a few verses later in chapter 13, verse 44. Kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, the treasure here is the same as the seed in the parable of the sower. It is the word of God. It is the salvation of God that has been sown into your life. And this man understands what has been sown. He understands this is, this is a treasure. This is, this is the most valuable thing that I have. Notice the first thing he does is he hides it again. He gets it deeper. He gets it hidden. He gets it where nobody can steal it from him. He recognizes, I've got something. Notice the second thing he does. For joy... He reorders his whole life around this treasure. He goes and sells everything for joy. He can't, he's so excited that he's got this treasure. Are you kidding me? This is amazing. And he sells everything and he reorders his whole life around this seed, this treasure of the salvation of God. So several years ago now, I was in a a city in Minnesota, Montevideo, it was, it was actually Saturday night. It was Easter Sunday. It was the next morning. And I had a dream that I, I once in a while, I get these dreams. And, and I think it's partly because I'm a pastor and I need to speak to people that God gives me dreams that will help people understand. But here's the dream that I had. The first scene, I'm in a Sunday school room. And there are kids all around and there are teachers all around. And we've got, there are crafts that the kids have made that are on the desks in this room. It's just a real laid back. Kids are there. It's Sunday morning where we've got crafts made. But I know, I don't know how I know it, but I know that in one of these crafts is hidden a precious jewel. And I know which one it is. And I take the craft, I pick it up, and I'm going to take it into the bathroom. And I go into the bathroom, I get into the stall, and I am just about to look at this jewel. I can't wait to see it. Scene one is over. Scene two, I have the treasure, but I have lent it to somebody that just wanted to hold it. 
And in, in scene two, I am watching this guy, who I don't know who he is, but he's walking along and he's got the jewel in his pocket. But I know that it's vulnerable because he doesn't realize what he has. He has no idea the value of what he has. And I'm just anxious to get the, the jewel back. S- scene two is done. Scene three. I'm standing in front of my house. I've got the jewel back. It's in my pocket. And I am contemplating how wealthy I am. I'm contemplating that I am a multi-millionaire. I contemplate the fact that it wouldn't, it doesn't matter what happens to my house and cars. It, it, that adds so little to my net worth. This is my net worth. I am a multi-millionaire as long as I have this jewel and I wake up. Guys, there's no way that God can describe to us how wealthy you are when you have eternal life. There's no way. It's, Paul says it's an incomprehensible gift. It, is, it says in Ephesians 2 that we will be unpacking this in the ages to come. There's no way that you, you and I, with our human little minds, can understand what God has paid for By dying on the cross so that he could freely give to us. It is his own eternal life. He has made us heirs of Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, of all things. This is what we have. Guys, whatever happens down here, whatever happens to your house or your things or your... Paul says everything else is dumb compared to this. The excellency of the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ. This is the treasure in the field. The more you know it, the more joy you're going to have. That's why David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. If I am not joyful about my salvation, I'm I'm not seeing right anymore. I'm not seeing right. Christianity should not be your ought to and you have to and, and it just becomes, it needs to be I get to. This is the engine room is joy. The engine room is, oh my, for joy, I get to reorder my entire life around this tree that's growing in me called the kingdom of God. All right, we're almost done. We are, this is point three, seed bearing plants. I'm just going to read three scriptures. Psalm one, two, and three. But his delight The godly person's delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. He has taken this word the word of heaven, and he's made it the most precious thing in his life. And he, and he meditates, he thinks about it in his free time, day and night, not just when he has to, but when he, when he gets some free time, he's thinking about the word of God. He's meditating on it. He's thinking about how it applies to his life. And that person is like a, a tree that is planted right by a river. Its roots go down and just drink, drink. It's got constant life. And in all seasons, it bears fruit and it affects everything else that he does. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. When we learn how to trust God, one of the Psalms, Psalm 92 says we're like palm trees. Palm trees grow in deserts. The secret to the palm tree is its root system. It just keeps going. Those roots go down as far as they have to go to get water. And what God does in our dry seasons, in our hard seasons, it seems like I'm bearing no fruit. Sometimes God's working on the root system. 
And he's sending those roots farther down, deep, he's calling to deep, and he's, he's making you invincible to all hardship by showing you how to drink, even while in the, how many know this world right now is a spiritual desert? But we've got this hidden water source that we need to tap into. And sometimes God brings a drought into our life because all the people around us are in drought and they don't know how to get water. And so he shows us how to get water in the midst of a drought and to bring forth fruit. And notice this. He doesn't fear when heat comes. Notice, he has no worries in a year of drought. It's a different culture in the kingdom. It's not a culture of fear and worry. It's a culture of trust and faith. And then finally, John 15, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus says we're a fruit tree. He provides the life. We provide the life he provides the, 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 the power, the strength, and we provide the life that actually is in the world that has fruit on it where people can actually get the fruit. We're the branches. We're, the, we're what the world sees. And he says, all you need to do is stay close to me. All you need to do is reorder your life around this relationship with me, and you, I will make sure you bear much fruit. Now look at God's plan for evangelism. Because when people eat your life, when people taste your life, they're not just getting fruit. They're getting the seed that is in that fruit that can reproduce that life. And God loves variety. He's got 415,000 different varieties of plants and trees. That's a lot of varieties. Have you noticed in nature that God likes variety? So the, here's the secret in the kingdom of God is learn how to be yourself filled with the Holy Spirit. God made you you. He doesn't want you to be somebody else. Stop comparing yourself to somebody else. Stop trying to keep up with somebody else. God doesn't want you to be that person. He's already got that person. He wants you to be you. And here's why. Because when you are being yourself filled with the Holy Spirit you're going to reach people that I could never reach. You're going you're to give fruit. When you are being yourself and you're at peace with who you are, that you are loved and delighted in, in God and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you're, you're going to help other people to grab the fruit of the goodness of God that you've experienced. And they're going to eat it. What, what does the psalm say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. David's not giving an argument. He says, taste. I'm not telling you to take my word about it. Here's the steak. Eat it. Taste it. Do you want more? They are, ta- they, well, how do they taste God? They t- by tasting us. If our lives are all about Jesus and close to Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit, they are going to taste our lives and they're going to say, that tastes really good. What, what, what do you, how does this work? And do you see that, that there's enough seed in you to change the whole world? Think about all the seed that's in this church right now. If, if we were confident in the abundance of God and we each day were giving our lives and were fearless to sow our lives and to, to love people and, and be with the homeless with the road home and get past all, everything that makes us afraid and, and just sow the goodness of God. Do, do you see that there's enough seed in this room right now to change the whole world forever? This is the plan. This is the, the plan was never... You know, you go, all get your friends. We'll put on a really impressive program in here. And you go get your friends and bring them in here. And we'll, we'll do the work in here. That's not the plan. This is the, this is the huddle. In football, this is the huddle where we talk about what we're going to do. And then we go out and do the play. The Christianity is out there, not in here. This is the huddle. We're finding out what God's saying. How God's directing. All right, I'm talking forever. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> 
I'm done. <coughs> All right, I've got... <laughs> You are very gracious. All right. Uh, if we could have everybody's head bowed for a moment, I've got two groups of people I want to pray for. The first, the first group is, is maybe you're here today and you don't know that the kingdom of God is growing in you. You don't know that Jesus Christ is living in you and that his Holy Spirit has planted eternal life and that something's growing in you and you don't even know how and it's amazing. And maybe maybe somehow, even though you've been around church, it always gets stolen because you haven't understood what it's going to mean to protect it. And so maybe, maybe that's you. The Bible says Jesus stands at the door and knocks. God loves you. Jesus died on a cross for you. He doesn't push the door down. He knocks and says, open up your life. Open up your heart. Let me bring my life. Let me bring my intimacy into you. You will never, ever be the same. If that is you today and you need to open up the door, you need to say, Jesus, come in and save me, forgive me, wash me, and give me this gift of eternal life. Would you just raise your hand right now long enough for me to see it and I'm going to pray? All over this place. I see that hand. Thanks. I see that hand. I see that hand in the back. Thank you, guys. If I upraise hand, anybody else that wants to join these, we're going to pray in just a moment. I got you. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? All right. I would like all those that raise their hands to just put your hand on your heart right now. Pray something like this to the Lord. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for knocking. And this morning, knocking very loud on my life and on my door. Lord, right now, by faith, I open my heart. I open my life. I repent of my sins. And I say, dear Jesus, take your rightful place. Sow your eternal life into me. I receive you. I receive your word. The Bible calls it a gift. I receive your gift right now. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we have got a book for you called um, Discipleship 101, and it's free to you. They're, they're back at the Welcome Center. We have some up here, too. If you come up to get prayer, just ask for the book. It's, it's yours. We want you to have it because it helps you to get this seed watered and weeded and growing the way that it needs to. Okay, could we all stand together? Here's the second group I want to pray for. You are definitely saved. You definitely have the kingdom growing. You've received that gift of eternal life. Jesus is the most precious thing in your life. But you see that things have been choking the word of God. They've been choking your relationship with God. The cares, worries, pleasures. It just became very obvious today. There's a lot of thorns in my garden. And I just, God, I want you to to weed out all of those thorns today. And God will never do it apart from us. He'll say, all right, there's a thorn there. And he'll make you put your hand down and then he will help pull it up. But but he never does this apart from us. You know, God, I give you my life. Make it all better. He's like, nope, that's not how it works. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to get down and get dirty in the garden with me. And I'll show you where all the thorns are. But you're gonna have to put your hand on it. You're gonna have to make a decision of your will, which is worship to me, to pull that thing up. And where there is a priority that's wrong, you're going to have to let me come in and turn the table over and say, not anymore. This is a house of prayer. This is a house of relationship with God. So if that is you, would you just open your arms to the Lord? I call this the received position. Lord, I am absolutely in this group. Lord, I, I just... I just so want your life and your beauty and your fragrance and your power and your healing to grow in me. 
Lord, you see all the competing things, all the fears and pleasures and other things that just, just, they just get into our lives and start growing and become more important than they should be. And so God, in Jesus' name, today, would you just help us to identify what priorities need to be changed? And Lord, I especially pray for where the whole Christian life has become a duty instead of a joy. Lord, would you touch our hard hearts today? Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? God, I especially pray for those that are facing a horrible lack today. Maybe it is a financial lack or a physical lack or a relational lack or or some type of lack today that frankly has caused fear and maybe even desperateness. Lord, would you just speak into every situation your grace, your abundance. You said that we would reign in this life through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Lord, would you just release your abundance over your people this morning? God, I thank you for it. Your favored sons and daughters, pour your abundance over them. I pray in Jesus' name. All right, guys. 